सभी जनालाई आज आपको कार्यक्रम में स्वागत है मो संजुला तामन आज आपको छोलफल को बीच से इंग्लिश स्पीकिंग नेपाली सिटीजेंस इंटरसेक्शनलिटी ऑफ क्लास कास्ट एथिसिटी एंड जेंडर इन प्राइवेट स्कूल्स रहे कुछ है यो छोलफल को लगे आपने संगा संगीता थेवेल लिम्बुजी होना चाहे संगीता � अंतरराष्ट्रीय विकास क्षेत्र में काम करने वाले कुछ हो रहा वहाँ वहाँ ले बिजनेस करी वहाँ संग महिला को राजनीतिक सहभागिता युद्ध पश्चात संक्रमण युवा बेरोजगारी पूर्वाधार विकास रहा सॉरी कारण में लगीता को प्रभाव संग संबंधित क्षेत्र और में वहाँ संग अनुसंधान को अनुभव था वहाँ ले ऑक्सफोर्ड यूनिवर्सिटी बाट सोशल एंट्रोपोलॉजी में एमएससी र लंगिकता विकास र पुमंडली कारण में लंडन स्कूल अफ इकोनोमिक्स एंड पोलिटिकल साइंस बामएससी गुण तेरी वहाँ सन् दुई हजार सत्रह में मार्टिन चौतारी में रिसर्च फेलो को रूप में काम करूँ और वहाँ का विभिन्न लेख जर्नल तथा पत्र पत्रि में प्रकाशित आज को कार्यक्रम सुरू कर चौतारी को कई अनाउंसमेंट हु पैलो यही तेईस फेब्रुवरी मंगलवार दिवसों बाहर बजे हेल्थ पोलिशी डिस्कसन सीरीज अंतर्गत रोल आउट अफ वैक्सीन अगेन्स्ट कोविड नाइन्टीन इन नेपाल अंडरस्टैंडिंग द इश्यू अफ एफिकेसी एंड इफेक्टिवनेस भय में डॉक्टर महेश महेश कुमार मस्क आएर बोलते हुआ यह कार्यक्रम में यहाँ सहभागिता जना सकूँ र दोसों को आज को यह कार्यक्रम जूम र फेसबुक लाइव दुबई बा चल रखे कार्यक्रम को दौरान में प्राविधिक कठिनाई आन सक यो खंड में हम इस सके चाँडों मिलाने कोशिश करने बेला यहाँ धैर्य धारण कर दिन होगा आज को हम कार्यक्रम दुई चरण में होने पेलो चरण में संगीताजी ने आपको प्रस्तुति राख्हने रोसों चरण में उक्त प्रस्तुति में थी हमें खुला छलफल अथवा प्रश्न उत्तर होने संगीताजी ने आपको प्रस्तुति पैंतीस देखि चालीस मिनट भि में राखीदिहला रब मैं सुरू करो संगीताजी हस् थैंक यू संजीला जी एंड थैंक यू टू एवरीवान जोइन कर जूम बट और फेसबुक बट हेरी रह सब थैंक यू सो मच फर योर टाइम थैंक यू टू प्रतिश दाई एंड थैंक यू टू रुक दाई फर फेसिलिटेटिंग दिस वेबिनार दिस प्रोसेस इफ यू नो बिंग पार्ट अफ दिस वेबिनार सो आज को प्रस्तुति मंग्रेजी में गुना गई रहे मैं लेखे जर्नल आर्टिकल मैं सिन्हास मार्टिन चौधारी को स्टडिज इन नेपाली हिस्ट्री एंड सोसाइटी में मैं रिव्यू को लगी सब्मिट कर सो यो आर्टिकल मैं अंग्रेजी में लेखे भर आज को प्रस्तुति इंग्लिशमें होने Um, so before I start my presentation, um, I just want to give a quick background on how I um, arrived at doing this particular research project. Um, so this was back in 2020. So it was last year around May. Um, so the tragic news of uh, mob lynching and um, caste-based killing of Navaraj Pike and his friends in Rukum uh, broke out in media. Uh, and following that story in the uh, feminist collective that I'm part of, Chokhut, we started having a lot of discussions around caste and ethnicity, uh, focusing on some of the questions around where does caste and ethnic conscious, co consciousness comes from and what role has schooling played in shaping our identities and our understanding of caste and ethnicity. Uh, and at that time, I was also doing my second master's in social anthropology at Oxford. Uh, and due to COVID, travel restrictions, um, and so forth, my initial research plan and my fieldwork plan was halted. So I was very much thinking about what was possible, uh, what kind of research can be done you know, during the time of COVID. So I thought about online interviews and I thought about building on this idea of exploring former students' schooling experiences further. Uh, and talking about my own positionality, um, I, as a Janjati female, uh, growing up in Kathmandu, who studied in private schools in Kathmandu, I had my own set of curiosities um, and questions that I wanted to explore. So in that sense, it's both an academic and a personal journey. Um, so I just want to specify that I do not have a prior background in education studies. Um, so in my thesis, I predominantly drawn on 
works uh, from anthropology and sociology. So in a way, I'm really looking forward to everyone's feedback, comments, question today uh, in terms of um, helping me improve the draft that I have prepared. So having said that, now I will directly jump into my presentation. I'm just going to quickly share the screen. Um, Okay, so I hope everyone can see the presentation uh, now. Um, so I would like to start off with uh, the story of Converse. Um, my presentation today is going to be very much narratives focused. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll begin with this uh, story of Converse. Uh, it was the mid 2000s and the craze of South Korean movies and dramas was on the rise, especially among urban youth in Kathmandu. Asta was a 15 year old student at that time and she was desperate to buy a pair of Converse shoes that were worn by good looking Korean actors and by cool and popular kids at her elite private school in Kathmandu. It was a big ask for her parents as the standard protocol in her middle class household was that before purchasing any new items, ideally at a bargain price, one must think about the product's usability, durability, and most importantly, its necessity. Converse shoes, unfortunately, did not meet those criteria, but Asta was determined. After a series of family discussions and, of course, a fair amount of teenage tantrums, Asta's mother finally bought her the shoes. That pair of Converse, however, was not from the famous Kathmandu Mall, where her friends went for shopping, but from a wholesale shop in Asan Bazaar, bought at a modest price of 600 Nepali rupees. Nevertheless, Asta was ecstatic but her friends were skeptical as they inspected her shoes. There was no logo inside, supposedly the mark of a true converse. Yet Asta remained exuberant. It looked similar from outside anyway. Now in her late twenties, Asta realizes that she did not have to buy those converse shoes. More than possession of branded goods, emulating media persona or gaining popularity at school, Asta's motives were rooted in the desire to fit in, to be accepted, and above all, to compensate for what she identified, uh, what she identified as her biggest shortcoming, which was not being able to speak the lingua franca Nepali in its suddha or pure form. Coming from a close-knit, high-caste Newa community, Asta's mother tongue is Nepal Bhasa. Although her school tried to enforce English as the primary language of communication, students covertly and predominantly conversed in Nepali. Asta's friends taunted her with Nepali tongue twisters, and she recalls how a Brahmin Nepali subject teacher made her feel embarrassed in front of the whole class time and again. Conscious of her accent, Asta gradually stopped expressing herself, both in the classroom and among her friends. She developed disdain for Nepal Bhasa, had little motivation to learn Nepali, and took comfort in learning English. Asta describes feeling insecure and inferior amidst her rich, flashy, eloquent, and confident peers. And she uses the term gumsinde janu, which are translated as devoid of fresh air and light to describe her schooling years. Now, I find Asta's story of Converse very interesting. It is not only about globalization, youth, media, class consumption, but it also shows how an individual navigates institutional ideologies and hierarchies. It is also about a family's aspirations for social mobility. And it incites a broader exploration on schooling, nation state, and modernity. So in this presentation, I will draw upon personal narratives of interlocutors such as Asta, who studied in private schools in Kathmandu between the mid 1990s and 2000s, to understand how formal schooling contributes in shaping subjectivities and social identities which is the broad objective of this paper and of the presentation. Uh, so I will pay close attention to the intersectionality of class, caste, ethnicity, and gender, and the interconnected discourses of modernity and nationalism that seems to underpin the everyday practices within private schools. <clears throat> Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> Uh, so first of all, I just want to clarify some of the concepts that I've used here. 
Uh, so in terms of subjectivity, I will refer to the description provided by anthropologist uh, Sherry Otner, uh, which I find particularly useful as it shows how individual and social are always entangled or interconnected. Hence, the focus on subjectivity is not just about giving importance to human experiences and their personal narratives, but also thinking about how the inner worlds of subjects are connected to the larger sociopolitical structures. And in order to do that, intersectionality offers a very important lens um, through its emphasis on how intersecting power structures complicate neat compartmentalizations of social identities. Uh, so at the same time, you know, how to operationalize intersectionality in practice is a very contested topic. Uh, so what I'll do is I will draw upon the analysis by Chu and uh, Ferry's work, which I found personally very useful. And they argue that intersectionality, uh, the lens of intersectionality, using lens of intersectionality is not just about including marginalized perspectives, but it is also about identifying and questioning the frameworks and structures that are unmarked, invisibilized, and normalized. So very much, you know, I think both of them complement each other, subjectivity and intersectionality in terms of their focus on agency as well as the wider system. Right, so I uh, won't go into depth in all the different social and cultural reproduction uh, theoretical frameworks that are there around, you know, schooling, inequalities and identity formation, um, you know, purely because I want to go directly into the findings as soon as possible. Um, but just to give an overview, you know, schooling is sort of considered as this very important site of self-empowerment and also of social mobility. But at the same time, you know, schools have also, uh, critical studies on schooling have also shown how schools reproduce uh, you know, existing sociocultural structures and inequalities. So here in particular, what I'll focus on is how various studies have used the theoretical framework of cultural production and how they have shown um, that you know, schools fosters new ways of being and becoming. And that one of the most salient social identities they create is between educated person and uneducated person, whose meanings are different depending on cultural and contextual interpretation. So this is something that I will draw later in my, essay, uh, in my presentation, in my analysis. So now I will focus on some of the uh, literature specific to Nepal. Again, I will just give sort of this very you know, um, broad overview. It's, it's a very quick overview um, as there's so much written in relation to education already and especially in relation to the panchayat system. So I just want to give a very broad overview. Um, so many academics have shown how the project of nation building has been central to the development of national education system in Nepal. The usual narrative is that at the end of the Rana regime, 1846 to 1951, uh, there were a handful of schools catering to the ruling elites, while the overall literacy rate was estimated to be less than 5%. So it was only in the early 1950s that various national level education commissions and committees were set up to draft plans and policies that underpin the expansion of formal education system in Nepal. However, whether it was the short-lived democratic government uh, between 1951 to 1960 or the autocratic monarchy under the Panchayat regime between 1960 to 1990, the concerns for the rulers appear quite similar. And that was how to foster shared national identity among the multi-ethnic, multicultural and multilingual populace. To that, to that end, education was imagined as this pathway for producing citizens with sense of shared national identity who were faithful to the monarchy, the unified Nepali nation state, and who were dedicated to Bikash or development of the country. And so various strategies were adopted to realize these objectives. For example, in 1959, Nepali language was introduced as the primary medium of instruction in schools. And historically, school textbooks that were published in Nepali language have played an important role in promotion of Hinduism, the Hindu monarch, the Nepali cultural identity uh, that are uh, based on sociocultural practices of Hill Brahmin and Chaitri caste groups. You know, and those textbooks introduced their multi-ethnic pupils to standardized written Nepali language and literature, and, um, and also national heroes, Hindu rituals, folk tales, festivals, deities, and custom. And um, Stacey Pig's um, article, Pratyus Unta's work, 
uh, have really demonstrated, uh, you know, how the formal education systems in Nepal have been both an ideological and political project. At the same time, there are also studies uh, such as Skinner and Hollands that really shows that, you know, school were in fact a very heterogeneous site with multiple voice voices as students and teachers did not always uh, endorse dominant ideas uncritically. Although the discourse of, you know, Bikash was not uh, questioned or challenged, but Panchayat state actors and mechanisms were certainly questioned. However, what we see is that the discontent was, uh, however, what we see is that this discontent with the state was predominantly framed through the lens of gender and class relations. Meanwhile, disavowal of class differences was considered as an important marker of being an educated person. So I think these studies really provide a very good uh, sort of analysis on the ideological foundations of Nepal's education system, the kind of citizens that the Panchayat state intended to produce, and also a glimpse of you know, how subjective experiences of students aligned and or differed from the state. So now in the post 1990s context, um, there is an increasing attention to the growing divide between public schools and private schools. And the differences are predominantly framed through two analytical frameworks. One is in relation to class inequalities, as in how family income mediates access to different kinds of schools. For example, private uh, schools are seen as catering to relatively wealthy clientele, while public schools are becoming the residential choice for low-income families. And the other is in relation to multilingual education policies that came into effect after 2006, and the different ways in which English, Nepali, and indigenous languages are ascribed unequal socioeconomic values, which has led to a kind of linguistic hierarchies. And these frameworks are not mutually exclusive. Uh, they they complement each other as uh, private schools through the unanimous adoption of English as a medium of instruction tend to embody higher symbolic capital and they are associated with quality, social prestige, and of course, middle class identity. Now here I have, in the paper, I've uh, engaged quite extensively with uh, Mark Lichty's uh, seminal work, uh, Suitably Modern, which chronicles the processes of middle-class identity formation in Kathmandu. Uh, I will not go into that in detail here, uh, but what I will say is that um, I want to build on Lichty's work further, um, as I've argued in the paper that the um, the, the, the foundation that is just built on consumption and class production is perhaps not enough in explaining some of the school experiences that I'll be talking about. So what I'll do is I will be uh, building on Lichty's work further to understand or examine how class intersects with other social structures derived from caste, ethnicity, and gender, uh, and, how they uh, and how they shape the everyday practices and subjectivities within private school. So these are some of the broad questions I will be focusing today in this presentation. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly check the time as well. Right. Um, yeah, so these are the broader questions. Um, so while the growing gulf between public schools and private schools in Nepal has received much attention in both public and academic discourse, there has been little discussions on questions such as how do private schools functions? What kinds of subjects do they produce? How do they train students to become citizens of imagined and global communities? And just looking at the historical development of education system in Nepal, social identities based on caste and ethnicity have long been considered as pre-modern and divisive to nation building project. And also my own interlocutors emphasize that they never openly discussed caste or ethnicity in schools. So if that is the case, I will also ask, is the framework of caste and ethnicity still relevant to the analysis of education systems in Nepal? And if so, how do they manifest remain disguised or get reworked. Uh, so for this study, uh, I actually conducted uh, 23 online semi-structured interviews, uh, but my criteria was that, you know, my interlocutors had to have studied in private schools in Kathmandu from primary level to secondary level of education, uh, you know, between uh, from mid 1990s to 2000s. So after that, I only focused on um, after the wonderful interactions that I had. Finally, when I was doing my analysis, uh, I focused on the narratives of 19 interlocutors. 
So my interlocutors are in their early, uh, are in their 20s and early 30s. All of them studied in private schools in Kathmandu, uh, like I mentioned, in terms of the criteria. 14 of them are based in Nepal, one of them in the UK, and four of them in the US. The interviews were conducted between July and October 2020 using online platforms such as Zoom, uh, Sky, Facebook, Messenger, where I conversed with my interlocutor in English, interlocutors in English and Nepali for an hour and a half on average. Besides interviews, I've also analyzed opaids and blog posts that have been published by former students about their private schooling experiences in Kathmandu. And my study takes a very retrospective case in a sense that uh, my interlocutors have gone through the private education system as opposed to uh, you know, being a student in contemporary times. Um, so it's, it sort of has this very retrospective case as opposed to bringing out this very re real time data. So I've anonymized the personal details of my interlocutors and I have used the broader caste ethnic clusters, which also function as uh, social political categories uh, to indicate their caste ethnicity. Um, so those categories are Dalits, Hill Brahmin Shetris, uh, Adivasi Janjati or Janjati Madhisi. Um, and although Niwa was categorized under, although Niwa would be categorized under Janjati group, I've chosen to mention them as a distinct category uh, as they are indigenous to Kathmandu and have significant socioeconomic clout and also to indicate their higher representation in my sample. However, it must be noted that some of my interlocutors may not necessarily identify with these broader sociopolitical categories. And why that is the case or how young people engage with social movements and collective identities is a very important question, but that is not something I'll be addressing through this paper. And um, I won't go further into limitations and so forth at the moment. I hope that these questions will be raised uh, during the Q&A session. So now I will directly go on to talk about some of the emerging themes and observations that I found in the data. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to provide some definition and some figures related to private schools. Um, again, I very much drawn these from Bhatta and Ferrali's work. Uh, if you would like uh, some more data, uh, relevant data, please do check out uh, their publication. So I've drawn most of the data from there. Um, so around 18% of the total schools in Nepal are private schools. Uh, most of the private schools are concentrated, unsurprisingly, in urban towns and cities, particularly in the Tarai region of Nepal. And as of 2015, around 17% of the total students are enrolled in private school. So that's including primary, lower secondary, and secondary schools. So I've taken, as I mentioned, I've taken these stats from Bhatta and Ferrari's paper, and I've taken the data and I've also done, uh, uh, I've also calculated them to uh, draw out some of the average figures. Um, so um, there is, in terms of the enrollment share, there is a gender disparity. So the enrollment share of boys in private school is 14% more than that of girls. And Kathmandu has one of the highest concentrations of private schools across the country. Within the Kathmandu Valley, around 68% of all schools in Kathmandu and Lalitpur districts are private, and 66% of all students attend these schools. Um, yeah, now I will move on to some of the themes. <clears throat> uh, so no doubt that the distinction between public schools and private schools is becoming entrenched. There's no doubt about that. However, private schools are often discussed as this very coherent, homogeneous entity. Although in few cases, in Cadell's paper, um, I found that you know, she, uh, she has mentioned elite and budget private schools. Uh, to sort of mark the intra-group differences within uh, private school, um, but there's limited elaboration on the characteristic. So based on my interlocutor's narratives, three distinct types of private schools emerge. So the first is the elite private schools. So they're the prestigious set of schools established in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that are renowned for their long-standing history and their association with ruling elites and foreign patrons. This category also includes new schools that were established in the late 80s and early 90s that charge some of the highest tuition fees of all private schools in Nepal. 
These new elite schools compared to old elite schools pride themselves in liberal values, creative pedagogy and foreign institutional affiliation. Both old and new elite private schools are known for their competitive entrance exams. They have an average of 60 to 100 students per class and those students are further divided into smaller sections with 30 students or less in each classroom. And the second one is the intermediate private schools. Now they are predominantly characterized by the overwhelming number of students. They have around 200 to 400 students per class. Uh, they, uh, who are further divided into smaller sections with 35 to 40 students in each classroom. They tend to have large scale physical infrastructures on a par with some of the elite residential schools. Intermediate private schools also offer residential or boarding facilities. Some of those schools were also popular for producing students with the highest marks in secondary level board examination or the famed Iron Gate SLC. Uh, but you have to bear in mind that this was also, you know, uh, mid 1990s and 2000 period that I'm talking about. And then there is local private schools um, that are relatively small, both in terms of physical infrastructures and student numbers. They, uh, they are also relatively less expensive compared to other elite or intermediate private schools. And they usually cater to students who live nearby or locally, and they tend to be lesser known outside their specific localities. However, they are by no means an exhaustive set of categories and they are open to contestations. Uh, while household income does mediate access to different kinds of school, I have refrained from using uh, or identifying the schools as upper class, middle class or lower class schools because the correlation between class divisions and the types of institution is not always evident or was not evident in the data that I had. For example, many of my interlocutors' parents had struggled financially to send their children to elite or intermediate private schools. And a few have studied with scholarships. So these categorizations are also relative and subjective, which I won't go further in detail. Um, so however, despite these ambiguities, I will be using these categories to highlight how private schools are a heterogeneous set of institutions. Now I will look further at the differences between these schools and how they're imagined and the different ways in which, uh, and, and the differences in the kinds of cultural and symbolic capital that they are perceived to embody. So my interlocutors who switched from local to intermediate private schools recall being struck by large numbers of buildings and school buses. Jyoti is a female Janjati former student who studied at a local private school. She recalls her experiences of visiting uh, intermediate and elite private schools during inter-school competitions. And this is what uh, Jyoti says. They had basketball courts, which was a new thing for us. They had big classrooms. Our toilets were smelly. Our so shoes were old. Their English was khatra. Our English was bad. Like, don't do that no. home. Because of that, they used to make fun of us. In Jyoti's narrative, what we observe is that the differences within private schools are premised on physical infrastructures, cleanliness, student appearance, and in particular, Khatra English, which I have modestly translated as good English. So both elite and intermediate private schools are imagined as these institutions where students develop good English. However, there's no unanimous consensus on what is considered as good English. So some of the common descriptive words used by my interlocutors are clean accent, clear pronunciation, without strong Nepali accent, and fluency. In fact, fluency in English was considered to have direct bearings on whether a student was considered as intelligent or not. And other studies have also shown, other studies in Nepal have also shown how proficiency in English has become a key indicator for measuring the quality of education. So now the importance accorded to English language in Nepal should be understood in a context where there has been an increased flow of goods, capital and technology, as well as a steep rise in international migration for foreign employment and education. Further, Fak and Sarma in their 2020 paper argue that private schools should be seen as neoliberal projects that reinforce market-based values of languages and render students as individual consumer in the global neoliberal market. Now, this interrelation between language and consumption is also reflected in my interlocutor's narratives, uh, whereby acquiring good English is not only associated with better education and employability prospect, but it is also about being able to consume 
global arts, music, fashion, uh, literature that would enable one to participate in conversation and socialization happening in schools. However, whether a school is considered as prestigious or not is further determined by their track record in getting students to successfully transition to educational institutions in foreign countries. And so elite private schools are perceived as gateways to universities abroad. So they tend to incorporate uh, the British and American curriculum, which are considered to be more prestigious than the Indian curriculum taught in many intermediate schools. So besides Nepali language, many elite schools teach the government prescribed curriculum only in the years when students have to undertake national board examination. They also tend to have a strong alumni networks and some of the new elite schools have designated staff to assist students with their university applications. Some elite schools allocate certain hours for community service and include involvement in extracurricular activities as one of the criteria in the student's annual performance review. Also, the possibility of being able to study abroad was a big motivational factor for students, as you know, highlighted by Dinesh, whose narrative I presented up on the screen. So what we see here is that overall elite schools are believed to endow students with cultural capital and social networks that will enable to make them a successful transition to foreign universities, predominantly in the US. Stacey Pig in her article argues that schools are primarily institution of Bikas, whereby schools produce an educated person who embodies urban, modern, progressive subjectivity, unlike an uneducated person who is associated with a rural backward population in need of Bikas. Uh, just to uh, footnote that Pig was um, uh, talking, uh, presenting her analysis in relation to uh, Panchayat era education system. Uh, further, under the Panchayat regime, the idea of educated person or body legumanti had a very ling uh, specific linguistic dimension, as ar argued by Uba Pradhan, that, you know, that a person has to be well versed in Nepali language. So now, in light of these discussions around the differences within private schools and what makes them prestigious or not, what becomes evident is that the idea of educated person in Nepal has become much more nuanced. The importance is placed on not just acquisition of good English and developing an urban, modern, cosmopolitan subjectivity, but it is also about being able to transition to higher education institutions abroad, predominantly in the West. In that sense, modern subjectivity and transnational mobility are now intertwined in making of the educated person. So then the question becomes, um, does the emphasis on production of good English speaking uh, modern subjects mean that the importance placed on Nepali language and the national cultural identity under the Panchayat regime have become obsolete in the post 1990s context? Is class and consumption the only significant markers of difference in private schools? So these are the questions that I will explore uh, for the rest of the presentation. <clears throat> right. So, school assembly is a daily ritual where everyone is reminded of their respective places uh, in the school's hierarchy. And it also functions as a primary mechanism for enforcing homogeneity in relation to gendered appearance and bodily comportment. So, amongst my interlocutors, except Asta, who went to a very liberal new elite school, the rest of the interlocutors had a very strict school assemblies, which had various, compo various components. So, the assembly would usually start off with prayers, either related to Hinduism or Christianity, if it is a convent school. In the case of one new elite private school, students would recite a Nepali poem by a famous Nepali poet with the messages of self-reflection. In some schools, assemblies were structured to allow students to practice their public speaking skills as they recited poems, motivational quotes, short stories, and narrated important news of the day. So the assemblies also functioned as this platform for rewarding good behavior and student success, which meant winning inter-school competition and or any other um, sort of academic and extracurricular achievements. And there would always be collective acts of singing the national anthem. However, disciplinary checks were an important feature of the assembly. Uh, 
the teacher or a student class monitor would check each student's nails, teeth, hair, and uniform. And if students did not adhere to the um, school dress codes, it would mean public shaming and or varying level of corporal punishment. So for boys, having short hair was of utmost importance. Otherwise, the head teacher would cut um, a student's hair in front of the whole assembly to enforce compliance occasionally. For girls, the rules were rather long. So vest inside the school shirt, um, uh, skirt or a pin for dress of right length, as in not too long, not too short, no makeup, no eyebrow threading, no hair color and straightening, and medium to long hair, neatly uh, plated using ribbons. Some of the schools prided themselves in having gender neutral clothes, whereby female students would be allowed to wear trousers, just like male students. But of course, that had to be of the right length and right diameter. The color of the uniform also mattered, not too dark, not too light, not too faded, not too old. And so did the fitting of the dress, not too big, not too small. And of course, you know, there were many Hindu symbolisms and practices uh, within schools. There would be statues and photos of Saraswati, the Hindu goddess of knowledge, and school prayers were dedicated to Hindu deities such as Saraswati, Brahma, and Vishnu. There would be special celebrations on the day of Guru Purnima in honor of teachers with a significance rooted in Hindu mythology. The major holiday breaks would be during the Hindu festivals of Dasi and Tihar. In Pratibha's local private school, our principal was a devotee of Shai Baba, so an Indian spiritual leader. And the school, which operated like a family business, was filled with Sai Baba's photos. And before the board examination, Sai Baba and Saraswati were worshipped together, and students were given tikka, flower, and prashad as a sign of good luck. So these are just some of the examples to demonstrate how private schools perpetuate and normalize hegemonic religious cultural norms, beliefs, and practices amidst its ethnically diverse student body. And these examples also further illustrate how it is not only through textbooks or school curriculum, but the everyday practices and symbolisms through which familiarity with the dominant cultural and religious frameworks is nurtured. And everyday practice such as the assembly further ingrains the notion of modernity through its association with specific kinds of attire and appearance. However, you know, Western style school uniform and school assembly are common features of most schools in Nepal. So what differentiates what happens in private schools? I mean, one could you know, definitely ask that. I mean, one way of looking at it would be that ensuring students strictly adhere to the school dress codes is performative acts through which private schools strive to maintain the distinction from public school. And they also attempt to mask any forms of material or class differences where everyone wears similar uniform and so forth. However, I would like to focus particularly on the disciplinary power that is exercised through assembly. So what can be observed is that, you know, how school assembly through a combination of disciplinary checks, public shaming, reward mechanism, and students class monitor system is designed to produce obedient, compliant, and disciplined students. And in doing so, it further establishes the authority of teachers over students. The students' bodies become a central site for establishing the social order, which has specific gender dimension. For, for example, extensive rules for female students concerning their public appearance can be read as the school's deliberate attempt to uh, uh, control their sexuality, with particular owners or responsibility placed on female students themselves. And the repercussion for non-compliance and resistance extends beyond the momentary public shaming that might occur during assembly. And Shristi's narrative is particularly relevant here. <clears throat> so Shristi is a female Madhisi student who went to a new elite private school and she was favored by her teachers. While anti-Madhisi and anti-Indian sentiments were pervasive in her school, and the class divide was explicit, with Shristi feeling conscious about a family not owning a car or being able to go abroad for holidays, Shristi grew up in a household full of books. Her brother listened to English music, she was good in her studies, she had a lighter shade of skin color, she spoke Nepali without accent, and she was considered as a good Madhisi. In that sense, she felt she could relatively pass. 
Some of her teachers reached out to her regarding her foreign college applications and they advised her regarding how to build her CV. Shristi had good grades, but so did her close friends. However, they were treated rather differently and they did not receive the same preferential treatment from their teachers. So I questioned Shristi about her likability. And Shristi reflects that she has always been a good student. Uh, she has always been an obedient child, soft-spoken, always submitted her work on time, and her teachers considered her as mature. However, one of her close friends, whose grades were even better than hers, was considered as very strong-headed. So when they reached class seven or eight, her another close friend went through a bout of teenage rebellion. She started wearing low cut shirts by which, you know, um, she refers to leaving a couple of buttons undone from the collar and uh, rolling sleeves up, which was considered as being sexual in public. In the past, teachers used to praise her friend profusely, but they seem to have decided that she was not the good conservative girl, kind of girl anymore. And so although her friend's grades did not change, the teacher's attitudes towards her certainly did. And Shristi's friend did not receive the same level of support as her. I think similar to Shristi's experiences and observation, many other interlocutors' uh, narratives also emphasize how likability and favoritism are deeply gendered. So there are many spoken and unspoken rules with the underlying message that along with good grades, female students must also demonstrate good gendered behavior and morality. Uh, and what uh, does that mean? Uh, it means that they need to be obedient, engaged, confident, uh, but not strong-headed. It is also important to conceal any signs of sexuality. That means wearing the uniform in the right way, not laughing out too loud, not speaking back to teachers, not hanging out with boys. However, Sristi's personal uh, experiences further reveals how different social identities intersect. On the one hand, She's conforming to these you know, gendered moral codes, which is crucial in maintaining good relationship with teachers. But at the same time, uh, she also has to pass as a Nepali, which was vital to abate some of the impacts of ethnic uh, stereotypes or prejudices are pervasive at her school. So now I will explore what does it mean to uh, pass as a Nepali and when does caste and ethnicity, when do caste and ethnicity become visible or not? Sorry, I'm actually checking the time as well. Okay, so during her schooling years, Aditi thought that there were only three caste, caste groups in Nepal, Bahun, Chetri, and Newar. Majority of her friends were from the Newar social group. At school, whenever anybody asked her what her surname meant, she would either say Chetri or that she did not know. She remembers one particular incident when a teacher inquired, when a dance teacher inquired about a surname. Her response was that she did not know. However, one of her friends interjected and said that, according to her grandmother, Aditi's surname belonged to Sanujat, or lower caste. Aditi still remembers feeling uncomfortable, but she's quick to emphasize that it was the only caste-related incident that she experienced at school. Only later, when she was pursuing her bachelor's degree, Aditi realized that she would be categorized under the social group. Unlike her school, there were plenty of Chetri students at her college, and she could no longer get away by saying she was Chetri. She felt awkward and confused, and clearly remembers searching on Google, what is Dalit? Aditi studied at an intermediate private school that taught Indian board curriculum. So the school also had a large number of Marwari students. Castes, tribes, and reservation systems are not unfamiliar topics in India, However, Aditi does not remember reading or discussing those issues in class. What she does remember is the anti-Indian sentiments directed towards Marwari and Indian students at her school. Reflecting back, Aditi argues that because there was a struggle between Nepali students and Indian students, her caste did not become an issue as she was a Nepali. In that sense, she considers herself a privileged Dalit. In Aditi's case, her surname is not one of the, you know, common, again, within quotation mark, not one of the common surnames associated with Dalit community in Nepal. And perhaps this ambiguity helped offer some form of disguise, which Aditi's mother wanted for her children, as she did not want them to feel conscious about their caste identity. Aditi's story is not at all unusual. 
So the discourse of caste, ethnicity, and Maoist conflict never featured in the everyday school conversation, nor in the curriculum, or in classroom discussion, or even as topics of debate competitions. That is the unanimous consensus of my interlocutors. So what explains this institutional silence? Uh, I, I've already mentioned earlier how the development of formal education system in Nepal is deeply intertwined with the project of nation building and modernity discourses. So, you know, in, in her 2011 paper, Valentin argues that caste is seen as pre-modern irrational structure, you know, antithetical to the dominant narratives of modernization and development in Nepal, and thus it is explicitly condemned in official school discourse. So, you know, here's a question that I raised earlier as well then. So does that mean caste ethnicity is an irrelevant framework within private school? Whereas Aditi's narrative illustrates how caste seems to matter less when there is the Nepal versus, Nepali versus Indian cleavage of, of some sort, Kavita's narrative below shows how caste becomes visible time and again. Um, so Anjilaji, are we good with time? Is, uh, am I running over or? Uh, pass minute bit, Rama. Okay. As you can notice, this is a rather long paper uh, and the insights are yet to come. So, Pat's minute, Vikram, I'll conclude Karta. Right, okay, maybe I will um, finish the caste ethnicity side and when it comes to meritocracy and so forth, perhaps I can take that under Q&A uh, section. Uh, so, I'll finish this section. Um, so every year when students progressed onto a new class joined by a new cohort of students and teachers, for Kavita and her sister, there was a question that never changed. What jat or what caste is this? That question would always come up when a new teacher was taking attendance. Spurred by the teacher's reaction, their fellow students would also question them with peaked interest and they would stand out once again. Kavita's standard response was that her culture was similar to Rai, Gurung, and Mogar, which are some of the commonly heard Hill Janjati ethnic groups. Then the query would end, or at least it would be enough for the time being. I think I've misplaced the slides. However, some offhand comments would emerge every now and then. So I put the comment up on the screen where Kavita says that. You know, I still remember like when we were in class eight and nine, people used to tease us like, yeah, you guys must be like nomads, rowdy types, Chepang like. We had no clue what our culture or ethnicity was because we grew up in Kathmandu with mom and dad basically. Both of them used to work and who had the time to teach you culture? So Kavita observed how another student who came from a minority hill Janjati ethnic group stood out in similar ways. Instead of addressing him using his first name, which was a norm, fellow students would address him using his uncommon surname. And in this, I really find Prem uh, Fak uh, G's article, um, or opinion piece on Kihu Yu Fak Pani Ko, what is Fak, uh, very useful here. So, in the context of Nepal, where surnames represent caste and ethnic identity, Fak argues that familiar and commonly heard surnames, usually from the dominant Brahmin and Chhetri groups, are never questioned. While the uncommon surnames, usually of minority communities and indigenous ethnic groups, are questioned and often subjected to ridicule. To that end, which surnames stand out and which do not, I think is also reflective of power structures. And, you know, Asa, whose story is featured at the very beginning, she said that, you know, caste was not openly discussed in school, but there was a difference. Those who looked different, uh, those who spoke differently, they were affected in some way or the other. And I find this narrative particularly useful in thinking about how manifestations of caste ethnic differences are multitude, unstated, and insidious. Uh, so, you know, for example, Asta herself in her narrative, she was very conscious about her, um, about her um, in Nepali not being pure. Uh, or Suddha. And that is also reflected in many of my uh, Niwa and Sanjati interlocutors who feel a sense of guilt for not being able to speak pure Nepali or write uh, Nepali well. Again, just like the discourse on good English, what counts as good Nepali is also contested. But some of the common um, narratives that come out is that it has to be devoid um, of you know, any other mother tongue languages and it is considered crucial to pass as Nepali. 
Um, so here I wanted to sort of bring in uh, the blog article that uh, Vikash Gupta had written about his experiences of um, studying in Budani Lilkanta School, uh, which is an excellent blog post. Uh, I would highly recommend everyone to check it out. Um, it's an opinion piece, uh, not a personal blog post. Uh, and, you know, uh, Vikash Gupta, he talks about um, his experiences of um, uh, growing up and studying in Budani Lilkanta School. And he, he sees how, um, how Budani Lilkanta functions as this very nationalist uh, place and a heaven for anti Indians where the supremacy of Nepali language, the cultural dominance of hill Brahmin Chetri social groups and glorification of their history were prevalent. And, you know, Budani Kanta has this very interesting um, system of using role numbers instead of uh, caste in order to create this level playing field. So now I just want to uh, present my, you know, final narrative here. I'm sorry, I'm very conscious of the time as well. So, uh, whereas, um, you know, in Gupta's uh, blog, he talks about uh, this experience of being, uh, you know, othered uh, as a Madhisi. Um, one of my interlocutors, Dinesh, who's a male Dalit former student who also studied at BNKS, for him, he says that, you know, the rule number system was an experimentation that really worked. You know, unlike his cousins who experienced varying level of caste discrimination at their schools, Dinesh argued that he was never made an outcast in Budani Kanta school. So now it could be because coming from a hill Dalit background, Dinesh shares similar physical and linguistic features with the dominant hill Brahmin and Chetri caste group. Hence, he did not stand out as the others, but that does not mean that the caste identity was erased. For example, Dinesh recalls few incidents that left him with a sense of discomfort and confusion. After the holiday, when he returned to his residential school, his Brahmin Chetri friends would return wearing Janai. Uh, so they would even name themselves as Janai Gang. Dinesh was asked to show his Janai as well. Um, he, did, he said he did not have one. One time there was an extensive discussion among his friends about which caste, clan, gotra they belonged to. Few days after the discussion, he realized that his friends had stopped inviting him to their secret hangout where they would usually eat together. There was also a time when his friends boycotted him for a few months when he received the highest marks in maths. Dinesh found that moment highly unusual as there were many other friends who were good in studies. So he wondered if he was being boycotted because of his past. So this is my final paragraph. So what becomes evident in many of my interlocutors narrative is that there was, and for some it still continues, a sense of anxiety, discomfort, confusion, guilt, feelings of standing out, of being out of place, but there was, and for some even now, uh, no structural framework to articulate and analyze what was happening to them back then. So what I'm arguing here is that while schools may not create caste, ethnic, racial divisions, they reinforce those divisions through their institutional silences, unchecked bi biases, and normalize religious cultural hegemony. At the same time, what we see private schools do in general is that they tend to project this image that everyone is treated equally regardless of their backgrounds, and students are differentiated and judged based on one criteria alone, academic merit. So um, I think on that note, I conclude. Um, so the last section very much talks about how hierarchical meritocracy is institutionalized. I'm sorry, I have uh, overrun, in, uh, I've overrun my presentation uh, a little bit, uh, but I'm more than happy to uh, take questions um, and discuss this further in the uh, Q&A session. So,